Blog Talk Radio. You are live at the Literary Lounge with your host, Destiny D, bringing you the newest and the brightest of the literary world right to your ear hole every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in, listen up. And learn something. This is the spot for new hot authors who are given the opportunity to shine each Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time we will showcase a new author here at the Literary Lounge we are taking out the time to give all of our literary friends an opportunity to showcase their work Hey, 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 this is your girl, Destiny D, live on WTLR Radio. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty with our intros, but that's all right, because we are here, and as you can tell, we are live. So we have a special guest for episode 21. His name is Brother Michael Muhammad, and he is the author of the new book entitled... Let's see. Green is acting up for me. I apologize for that, guys. It's Checkmate, The War for the Black Mind, Part 1, titled The Black Woman. Um, Do listen in for the next hour or so because we're going to be doing an interview with him about his new book, a little bit about himself. And also, we're going to be working on um, his release for this book, also where his book can be found, and a little bit of background information. So thank you guys for tuning in, and we're going to check and see if he's on the line. So hold on for just a moment. Okay, Brother Michael, are you there? Uh, Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you wonderfully. Thank you so much for for coming in today for this interview. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, what I want to do first and foremost is allow you to take a moment to just tell the world who you are, where you're from, and what type of writing style you work with. Well, sure. Am I am I live on air, uh, Sister Destiny? Can you hear me? Sister yes, Destiny, are you there? Oh, yes, okay, sir, yes. Hi. Uh, well, okay, great. Well, uh, this is Brother Michael Muhammad. Thank you, uh, listeners of Transparency Library, for this opportunity. And thank you, Sister Destiny, for giving us authors an opportunity to express our interest in the literary form. Well, um, as you were stating earlier, I am the author of a book uh, called Checkmate, the War for the Black Mind. And um, basically, I started this writing about, uh, say, about three or four years ago, but it's a research study that I have done about 17 to 18 to 20 years ago. And um, what interest, what started me in this interest was basically my own existentiality. I decided to find out some of the reasons why I as a black man and us as black people have had such a difficult time throughout uh, modern history, modern history meaning the last 500 years. And that's what prompted Mm -hmm. me to do the research study into Checkmate, uh, the war for the black mind. 
some of your listening audience uh, may um, be familiar with the term checkmate, which is a term specifically to the game chess. Um, it has a very interesting history, which is the very last page of my book, and uh, what actually describes the the actual history of the term checkmate. The word mm-hmm. uh, checkmate has to do with one thing only, and this is what I think a lot of the uh, sisters and black women in general would understand. Those who play chess know that the most powerful piece on the chess board is the black woman, or the woman in this case, also known as the queen. The king, however, uh, who is the leader, if you would, of the chess board uh, section, whether it's the black or the white section or whatever color you have, if the king Mm -hmm. is boxed in, if he's defeated, then then the game is over, then the kingdom, if you would, because that's what the indication of the chess piece is, the kingdom is defeated. Now, I'm not writing this book in reference to the game chess. You know, I had a guy, I was vending somewhere during the summer, and I had a guy who was so caught up in his history of chess that he really wanted to attribute my book to the game chess. And I was like, brother, I said, brother, I enjoy the game chess, but this has nothing to do with the game of chess. You know, this has to do with the reality of life, you know, the reality of life for us as as a people. So I chose the term checkmate because uh, sister destiny, as I was doing this research into various things that you're going to find in this book, very to be very, very interesting. I found Mm -hmm. that, the reality is that this was actually a chess game going on on the very highest levels. And uh, Mm. to quote the biblical scripture, where it says, we war not against flesh and blood, but against Mm -hmm. principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so this, this, this here um, research study, you know, there's people who write books. Let me let me interrupt myself for a moment. There are people who write books based on opinion. Opinions are okay, but I don't like opinion when you're dealing with these kind of subjects about what happened to us as a people. The reason being yeah. is the reason I don't like that is because that's where a lot of things get wrong. You know, I, I love my brother Kanye West, but he has an opinion that's just completely wrong on slavery. You understand what I'm saying? Right, not validating, yeah. you know, not not with any validating facts. The brother doesn't clearly read anything on the subject. He's just coming up with opinions. So that's why I don't mm-hmm. like opinions. I, I always trust the researcher, even when I was in high school. Um, so the type of training that I had as a high school student and as a student mm-hmm. of scripture and ultimately as a student, a novice student of history, is in my book. Mm-hmm. and And that's pretty much the origin of how checkmate the war for the black mind part one the black woman got to be right now i i was actually like when you said the 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 quote from kanye west that that stuck out because you could tell that he has not been educated when it comes to what he spoke about you could tell that it was something that was just opinionated the and it and it caused the uproar but it did its purpose because he had fell off for so long um, due to all of the things that he had going on emotional-wise and, um, I guess, out in the public eye as far as, like, not having anything current or um, nothing that, that revolved around music at all. Like, the last thing we saw from Kanye was that he was emotionally disturbed. He had to dye his hair. And he had right. dealt with the breakup or something with Kim Kardashian. So he was not in the news for anything. He wasn't in the music highlights for anything. So when he did this, this was just a ploy to get his face out there. But he did mention that um, that there was a means of revolt or something like that. Like he was like, slavery couldn't have taken 400 years or whatnot, because if it had been the people from now, they wouldn't. Have, they had. They would have made a choice not to be slaves. But apparently, um, he knew nothing about Nat Turner. 
because he was one of the major people who led revolts, who did buck the system. So he doesn't, he he has no accreditation when it comes to being able to tell somebody that, you know, we wouldn't be slaves, we can't be slaves because nobody can enslave us like it's a choice. No, it's not a choice. But at the end of the day, if you're going to be a slave, they, they either had to break you or break someone higher than you to make you feel like you couldn't be free. But when you have a leader that is strong, like Matt Turner, you will revolt. You will not stand down and you will not allow those things to happen Absolutely. to the people that you. So if he knew that, Absolutely. he wouldn't have said, said what he did was for ratings. But, but yes, tell us uh, well, where, where you're from. A little bit about your um your hometown, like that. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, you know, in, in this information to the listening audience, you can find some of this information on the back of my cover of my book when you purchase it. Uh, so you'll get a signed autograph copy when that time comes. We'll, we'll get to that. I'm from uh, the cold, windy mountains of upstate New York, from a small town called Monticello, New York. Um, a place that cultivated me, gave birth to me. My mother is from Brooklyn, New York, and my father is from the country roads of rural South Carolina. Uh, both of them Ooh. had returned to the es- yeah. That both of them had returned to the essence. Um, so may God be pleased with their uh, works. Uh, they were godly people. Mm-hmm. My father was the pastor of a church, a Seventh Day Adventist church, and my mother. Uh, was his wife in every sense of the word. She also worked as a nurse, uh, nursing assistant, if you would, for many, many years. And putting that, I say that those that bit of information as a level of importance because, you know, both of them were dedicating their lives to helping people. And right. that is the foundation in which I and, and my older sister have uh lived on to. I'd like to say I think this book here is my attempt giving some clarity to what has happened to not just the black community but the black world if you would mm-hmm. since the in uh I guess the time period in European history is called uh the enlightenment stage or I should say the uh period when it came out of the dark ages. And so mm-hmm. this is a help you know, in that spirit of helping that my parents had done, this is my attempt at uh, giving what I have learned to uh, the world. And so that's my history. I was blessed mm-hmm. to be a part of a lot of organizations and a lot of groups uh, in my young years uh, coming up. I'm now a middle-aged man. And so some of my accolades uh, or groups that I've been involved with have been, um, I guess, my first title. I was a youth leader for a few years in my local church uh, growing up um, in upstate New York. And so my father, let let me back up and say my father, who was a strong influence in my life. We all lived in a nuclear family. I'm not one of those people who um, didn't know his father. My father was truly the leader of his home. He was mm. he was in the home, <laughs> you know. My mother, yeah. you know, did not try to usurp his authority. She she, there wasn't any battles. There wasn't any abuse between the two of them. There weren't any cursing and all that. So that allowed my brain to focus on higher things as a young age, if I may say right. that. Um, I was given by God. I was blessed to have that kind of foundation, which was absolutely necessary to do this kind of research study because when you have a bunch of mess in your home, then your mind, Mm. the mind of the child can't focus on big things, you know? So my father was also a vice president of a local chapter of the NAACP, but I don't know how people feel about these organizations, but my father himself was an activist. He worked with all groups, whether you were black, Muslim, black, Hebrew, black Christian or just a regular old person in the street, he tried to help his people. My my mother and father took in dozens of of foster children 
You know, we were poor now growing up. We weren't rich in any means other than rich in spirit. But um, they took in dozens of foster children. So from the time I was about eight years old all the way up till I was 17, we had foster brothers and sisters in my home. You know, and I helped to, uh, you know, take care of them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because I've had a couple of PKs on the show. And for those who don't know what a PK is, that's a preacher's kid. Um, (laughs) And a lot lot of them have had the uh, problem of maintaining, uh, I guess you would say, like a spiritual guided life, per se. Like, I've noticed that a lot of them... Um, to the outside world feel as if they have to be somebody other than the child of a prophet or a preacher in order to Understood. be Understood. accepted to be accepted in a worldly uh, scope. So it's like they were the worst kid <laughs> because they were I actually understand. trying to prove, they, uh, they were trying to prove themselves to the outside world. So did that did that have any kind of a role in your life, or were you just a stickler to the rules and all that good well, stuff? Well, well, let me let me let me put it like this, you know, and I, and I thank you for that question because, you know, I don't I don't, I, I don't want to take too much time on that because I can speak for two three hours on this because I I was blessed <laughs> to have parents, uh, sister Destiny, that mm-hmm. were not hypocrites, and and let me I'm not suggesting that these pastors and preachers and ministers are are hypocrites, but there wasn't any cursing in my home, okay? There wasn't any abuse other than me getting spanked, of course, by my mother in the home. I didn't see my father walking with a uh, a wife beater shirt and coming home drunk. My father didn't drink. My they, my parents didn't smoke. They didn't eat poison animals. They didn't uh, steal from people. You you understand what I'm saying? So a lot yeah, of times, my father, I spent a lot of times with my father. Okay, so mm. let me explain what I mean by that. My father brought me with him when he went to these church meetings. He visited a lot of churches, and he went to a lot of meetings. And I wasn't sitting at home wishing that I was with my father. He brought me with him. So that helped me to love him, if you would. And because I loved him uh, so much, my father, till this moment, you know, I have not been around a greater man than him because my father really didn't do ill to even in private. He didn't chase women, even in private. He didn't, you know, uh, smoke cigarettes or he didn't, you know, the only thing that he may have done wrong is he ate some pepper steak sandwich that the doctor said he shouldn't have had and that ultimately led to his heart attack, which, you know, made him uh, expire uh, prematurely from us. But that wasn't something that was bad. A lot of times when I have seen other preachers, and I'm just telling Mm -hmm. you what I've seen, because I've been around a lot of preachers and pastors in my time. A lot of them Mm -hmm. were hypocrites. Now, let me explain. They didn't believe in the scripture that they said they believed. They were cursing. They were chasing Mm -hmm. women. They would mm-hmm. spend time with their family, you know what I mean? And a child of that is going, to, is going to resent their upbringing. Whereas my right. spirit, even to this moment, even to this moment is my father was a great man. Not because I'm yeah. just saying that because he's my father, but because he truly was a great man. And yeah. so that allows me to have this spirit, even as a young person, that I didn't want to disappoint him. Because he mm-hmm. lived an upright life. In other words, right. he didn't just talk it, he lived it. Okay. And, and I'm going right. to go further. Right. I'm going to go further and then I'll be quiet after this. My father, <laughs> since he was the pastor, he didn't, he didn't do a lot of talking about godliness. He lived it. There's a difference. Right. Yeah, it's a big so difference. a lot of these pastors and preachers, let me tell you, if, I, if, I'm, if anyone has, is a son or a daughter of a clergy or a clergy themselves, there's a difference between you living the life and talking the life. My father lived it. He didn't talk it so much. He just helped people. I'm going to tell you, Sister Destiny, yeah. my father just helped people. Right. He gave money out of his pocket. Homeless people, he would give them food. I was with him when he did this. There was no selfie cameras back then. You know what I mean? 
He didn't do it for the camera. Mm -hmm. It was in him. I I noticed because my mother didn't even see some of these things because she wasn't around him when he was doing it. I was around him. I saw him stop Mm -hmm. the car in the middle of the street when we were some town, and he would give a couple of dollars to a homeless person. He would go bring somebody to get some food. I was nervous because these people were crazy, you know? These these were drunks and drug addicts. And so I say all that to say that I didn't have the preacher kid syndrome because my father Mm -hmm. was not a hypocrite. He lived the life of the Lord. And so that made me love him so much. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that, I mean, I'm glad that you were able to to share, you know, that information about him because that that does create the most powerful impact on a young black man is to have a strong black father because there's so many absentee fathers. There's so many um, men who have had to take on the role as the male role model uh, for most children in our society now. And then there's right. some that just don't have it. It's like completely not there. And the mother is playing both roles, but wholeheartedly a woman can't play both roles, but she can try as, as hard as she can. But at the same time, you know, there needs to be some male figure, some positive male figure in their lives but you like you said most of the ones with the good soul you know have already went on you know my father he played a major role in my life and he was there every day you know he worked of course but he was there every day so it's like when it when it comes to his grandson um he's no longer here to give words of wisdom or you know helpful guidance that he would have got you know from him being around so it's it's very difficult you know, for single mothers to do what they need to do. And we try to make sure that the child comes out the best as possible because we don't want them to fall to the outside world. So I I definitely commend your father. Um, and, I, and I express my most sincere condolences to your loss. Um, I know that oh, being that you are who yeah. you are, no, he still lives in you. So every day that you breathe, oh yeah, um, you pass along that legacy. So that is very, very appreciative. Um, what I want to do is I want to take a, a short break, and then we're going to come back with some more information about your book. So I need you to um, hold on the line for me just a moment, okay? Sure, sure. All right. Thanks a lot. This is the spot for new hot authors who are given the opportunity to shine. Each Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will showcase a new author here at the Literary Lounge. We are taking out the time to give all of our literary friends an opportunity to showcase their work. The New Author Spotlight is a platform that allows us to ask up to 10 questions or more to give you, the audience, the most in-depth current information about each writer in their literary piece. We will have a new guest every week. Stay tuned. All right, guys, we are back, and we are live at the Literary Lounge, and this is your girl, Destiny D, and we are on WTLR Radio. Today's date is October the 6th, 2018, and we have a young man by the name of Michael Muhammad here on episode 21 of our show. He is the author of the new book, Checkmate, The War for the Black Mind, Part 1, The Black Woman. Um. I want to give him a moment to talk a little bit more about his book, um, the publishing um, aspect, and all of that good stuff. So we're going to see if he's on the line still. All right. I am here. All right. Glad that you're here. So 
we want to talk a little bit about your book. I know you mentioned something in the first segment about um, the title and some of the information that was provided as far as, like, it being a case study. But how long did it actually take you to yes. write this book from to finish? Wow. Well, that's a good question, Sister Destiny. I, I believe, you know, research studies uh, books, uh, for those who've never written anything, are different than, uh, let's say, a novel or even a biography or autobiography, if you would. And because, mm-hmm. well, it, let me back up. Autobiographies are also a little different because you have to do research in order to do it. But research studies require a period of research and then you're writing what you're researching. So it's a little bit longer to write uh, a research study book, and just, just for those who are interested in it. And, um, you know, it came about because uh, actually how this whole thing got started for me was um, I started getting ill, and I was getting ill to the point where I started getting all types of things happening. My body was deteriorating you know, in, internally. Uh, this organ was failing, this organ was failing, that, some, you know, all types of medical maladies were happening to me. And as, mm-hmm. as the whole saying goes, death was knocking on the door. And mm-hmm. as death was knocking on the door, one of the, th- one of the things that I feared the most was going to my grave with an incomplete or incomplete mission. And mm-hmm. my youngest son asked me a my youngest son asked me a question a few years ago at the dinner table. He and I were eating. Just, he was just him and I, and he said, Dad, you know, you got all this knowledge about this and that, and you ain't doing nothing that I can see to help nobody. Now, of course, the boy didn't see the last 20 years of my life because he wasn't living with me then, so he don't know what I've done up until that point. Mm-hmm. You know, when, he, when, he, when he made the statement, I said, you know what? It, it, he's right. I was like, if I'm on my way out, I said to myself, if I'm on my way out, I don't want to leave this planet with that, with having a whole bunch of knowledge and information that the people need. And so that's amazingly enough, Sister Destiny, when the floodgates of information start coming. Um, this book was almost like I didn't write it. And I'll explain that in just a moment. As I started I writing this book from the Say again? No, no, no. Go ahead. I was agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. As I started writing the book, it was almost as though that God himself was writing it. And I'm not trying to grandize myself because, believe me, that's not my spirit. But I would go back and look at some of the information that was being revealed to me and some of the history that I was able to uncover discovered mm-hmm. and I said, My God, this 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 is amazing stuff. Not because I'm I'm grandizing like a rap artist saying, Oh, I'm so great. No, 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 no. I was saying it because there was no way that Brother Michael Muhammad himself could have thought of these things that I was writing about. And I had this mm-hmm. special electrical I don't it's hard to describe. It was like the you know the church they say the spirit of the Lord came over you, and the spirit is with you. And I felt like that as I was doing the research and writing at the same time. It was like yeah. something guiding my pen. And so mm-hmm. as I was as, or guiding my, my finger strokes on the computer, if you will. And so at the conclusion of the book, you know, um, I, I said to myself, wow, this wasn't all me. This was God himself who put this in me to do because this was not what I wanted to write about. To to be honest with you, I did not want to write on this, but it was so blazingly obvious what God was directing me to do. And so um, for anyone who wants to write in that manner, my suggestion would be make sure it's from you. Make sure it's something you really want to be a part of. Um, You know, that's, that's how this book came about. Right, right. Because when you were saying, um, you know, as far as like it was as if he was leaving the pen, I was agreeing with that. I know how that can be because like I, I myself have sat down in front of the computer before and it was like things that I wouldn't have known 
like any other way but through him. Um, I was able to depict it, write it down, give reference into it and everything, and I did not even know it was real. You know, I, I literally, right. like, put information into my first book from a dream, and it was given to me in a dream format, you know. So when I wrote it all down, right. I found out after I had wrote it that some of the things that I had depicted were actually true things. Like, you could literally go to the Bible wow. and find verses that depicted the four horsemen and what color the, the horses were and how they were fashioned as far as humanoid but not human. And I had no idea about all that stuff until I actually went to that part of the Bible after it was written. He can give you uh, motivation and wisdom and things of that nature to put into your book. And I, me personally, I have written stuff and went back to it later and like, what in the world was I thinking when I wrote this? This don't even, it didn't Absolutely. even look like stuff that I was written. So it was like, dang, I was on some, you know, some out of this world type writing and I didn't even realize oh, it was right. like, they had told me that I had wrote it and my name was on, like, I wouldn't even remember writing it because he was just so Absolutely. fluent and so focused, you know, us getting the information out. So, yeah, that's why I was agreeing right. with what, you know, you said about him being the leader behind the fan um, because he can, like, move you and fashion you into a way that what you're writing is not about you and it's not your message. It's his message through you, and he's giving it to you, you know, unbeknownst to you. So it's like when you go back to read it, you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> but, yeah, so that I was agreeing with you. Um Yes, ma'am. Now, who published your book? Can you tell us about your publisher? Uh, sure. Um, the publisher of a book, uh, of the book is a, a friend of mine, a uh, good brother, who's uh, published hundreds of books by the name mm-hmm. of Patrick Muhammad. Uh, he's the owner of a company called uh, Rath C Publishing, R A T H S I Publishing. Um, brother was uh, instrumental in the initial stage of the book publishing um, and okay. directing me what to do um, as far as, you know, once I completed the manuscript, if you would, um, I, you know, had to move on from uh, the publishing firm as I grew, you know, in, in my marketing of the book to some other marketing okay. strategies, but uh, he was very instrumental in the initial stage. Now, I noticed that you said his last name was Muhammad. Is, is he related by chance? Well, you know, that's that's a question we get asked, you know, uh, asked a lot. Um, I'm a student, of course, of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Um, and uh, in the beloved nation of Islam, under the guidance of the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan, most of us, have various names uh, to readapt our family. And so in the spirit of, of the old tradition that you probably heard about with Malcolm X, where we remove our slave name because that belongs mm-hmm. to the slave master, not us. So in that yeah. spirit, um, you know, over the years we have had exes, which just simply mean unknown, you know, and then once mm-hmm. uh, the attribute of the person is known, you know, at one point I was Michael Six X, and um, as I evolved, I became Michael Muhammad. And so, you see this uh, in the scripture when you see Paul and Saul, you know, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego it used to be uh, Hananiah, yeah. Zephaniah, and, and Obadiah, or something like that. So th- this is the same yeah. spirit here in the nation of Islam. So. People often think we're all related. We are related in spirit, but not in blood. And so we are part of the right. Muhammad family. Uh, yeah, no, Brother Patrick is not blood kin of mine, but he is a uh, mm-hmm. spirit of mine, along with hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of others who also have adopted the name Muhammad, which loosely translated into English simply means one worthy of praise, one praise much, and I am striving to live up to that name as we speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I had a very good friend of mine who um, gave me a, 
I guess you would say Hebrew name. He called me Beth Yah, the daughter of Yah. Um, okay. So I know about the name change, the differentials and stuff. So I think that's awesome. And I also think that we're all related to some degree because we're all started in, in all derivatives of Adam and Eve anyway. But it's just who's closely related and who's, uh, what they say, twice removed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. You know, we have uh, brothers from another mother. We have, you know, sister girlfriends and things of that nature. And I actually found people who were not like closely blood related to be more family than the ones that you are attached to, you know, by blood. So, Say that again. Um, Say that I mean, again. <laughs> I definitely. Exactly, you know, where it comes from when you find people who are like minded and um, you find positive people. Because, like, I have two sisters right now to this day, and we can look at each other and probably pass each other without speaking. That's And, and it's not a good thing. I'm not glorifying it. Right. But I have girlfriends who I'm able to talk to better than my own sisters, which I know that's a product of, of, of the environment, things that has been set in motion to divide the black family to start with. But you know, Absolutely. I found myself yeah. able to connect with, with the women outside of my family line. Like, I've noticed this year, the year of 2018 has been a separation of the highest magnitude. I've seen so many people ostracize themselves from their families. And, like, if I had the money right now, I'd move from my family. You know, so it's like I, it's, like it's, it's, it's orchestrated. It's, it's set up for it to happen. You know, I wish things were better, but at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to subject yourself to the same things over and over again, and you don't want to be connected Absolutely. to negative people. Like, I feel like it's best to remove. He said, "Get away from your kindred land." Yeah. Well, so you know, I, if, I, if I may. If, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, ma'am. Uh, well, I know we have a delay in the thing, but I was going to say, if I may add on to what you're saying, Sister Destiny. Um, to the mm-hmm. listening audience, you know, a lot of us who read the Bible, um, we understand that the spirit of separation is something that God Himself has ordained. Um, right. You know, uh, the Bible speaks. The Bible speaks specifically. Um, you know, you know about separating the mother from the daughter. You know, and the father from the son. And it, it has to do with, uh, if I may say, you know, it has to do with the spirit. Of if, you, if you're trying to live a righteous life, you know, um, there's a challenge for those around you versus you yourself. Believe me, and, and, and the Bible also says that they of their own household will become their worst enemy. And so mm-hmm. I have found that to be true, and it only is true. It's only true if the people around you, if you're trying to improve yourself, if you're trying to live a righteous life and the other people around you are not, they're going to despise you. They're going to hate you. They're going to do all manners of evil against you falsely. This is what the Beatitudes that Jesus spoke about, you know, this is what they're going to do. And, you know, Sister Destiny, these people who call themselves your family, whether it be your children, whether it be your your significant other, whether it be your parents, your cousins, your mother, whatever, they don't realize that they're getting that evil because they're not Mm -hmm. studying the same way that you're studying. You see? Right. That's why they they become this way. Yeah, I've tried to, you know, when when you become more enlightened and when you become abreast of, you know, the situation when it comes to the truth, because there's a lot of false prophets out here and there's a lot of false teaching. So when you begin to have your third eye open and you begin to learn different things, the first thing that a person that learns this stuff wants to do is to take it home to bring other people to the light because you want them to be um, just as powerful as you are. You want them to be enlightened just as much as you are so it's like when you get to them you try to tell them the righteous teachings and the right things and and you break down you know all of these different things that you've learned they say yeah okay and it goes in one not the other and they're back in church on sunday and then 
<laughs> Monday through Saturday, they're cussing out everybody. they treating the children right. crazy. they all this other extra right. stuff. they backbiting. They, they, they talk about people all the time like they're not even in the same room. I mean, like, you have no idea how many countless conversations I've heard with my name being brought up where they're just talking, just slap sideways. And I'm like, I haven't right. done anything wrong. And it pushes me to want to leave. But then when I try to tell them, okay, you have to be careful. And, I, and I've told them that plenty of times. I said, you have to be careful what you say about and to people, especially when they're connected to the most high, because you're going to reap you what go. you sow. You're going to reap right. exactly what you sow. And I said, and be mindful that when you plant that seed, you're not going to get a seed in return. You're going to get a plant that's going to, in fact, grow into a tree that's going to bear fruit. And then that fruit is going to have seeds inside. You got to remember that you're not just going to get that seed that you planted. And I let it be that because <laughs> I know that eventually I'm going to start seeing the reaping. And, you know, a lot of times the reaping comes in fashions. Of, it comes in fashions of uh, oh, yeah. situations with your children. You know, it trickles oh, yeah. down. It don't just affect yeah. them. It affects everything that's, a, the that's children. attached don't to believe me, I'm... I know about that, Sister Destiny. I done seen that firsthand, and believe it or not, I'm not trying to bring it back specifically to the book for any other reason, but it's it's apropos for this part of the conversation. The the reality for me is my study of this research into us came from my need to understand what happened to our black women Mm. psychologically. Now, yeah. I needed to understand that as a young man in my 20s and 30s. And mm-hmm. it was something that God, I feel, put me through a 20-year study because it was necessary. You know, I, and I'm saying this because a lot of a lot of my pastors and, and ministers, whether whatever group they're in, a lot of the religious mm-hmm. leaders from different groups, whether it be the traditional Christian family church, whether it be the Nation of Islam or traditional Muslims mm-hmm. from the East or Hebrew Israelites and people like that, it doesn't matter what group you're from. A lot of them mm-hmm. do not study. I'm talking about the religious leader of the groups. Uh, a lot of the mm-hmm. local church people, whether they don't study psychology enough. They don't study history and pathology enough to understand what's happening in their congregations. So I hear a lot right. of people speak on rostrums. A lot of people sit on them rostrums and them podiums, and they give strong, powerful lectures, but they're not solving the problem. We've had right. more preachers. We've had more pastoring in, in, in mm. the last 200 years than any group of people in human history. Mm. And yet we're worse off than any other group of people in human history. The reason being the is best- Satan... Satan himself has, is, running the uh, is running the church, but but I was gonna I was gonna say he's he's being slick about it. So mm-hmm. what happens with the slickness and in and in my book, they try to make evil fair seeming, you know. Uh, yes, there, there's an old, mm-hmm. there, yes, man. There's an old sign I saw in Virginia one day, uh, one of those uh, billboards. It said, "What mm-hmm. part of thou shalt not." Do you do you understand? Do you not understand? Mm-hmm. What part of thou shalt not do this doesn't make sense to you. And so right. one of the things that I am, my mother was this. Now I'm going to use my mother for an example where I, where I get this mm-hmm. from my mother. My mother was an uncompromising woman when it came to the word of God. That's why Brother right. Michael is that way to this day. She lived the life of God. She didn't just talk it. She lived it. But when it came mm-hmm. to rules and how God said you're supposed to live, that's how she ruled. And that's mm-hmm. the way I found success in that. Because when I got to be an adult in my 20s, you know, how I got into this research study, I found out a lot of people didn't know some of the things that I knew about how to live. Mm-hmm. And then when I started becoming more acclimated and trained in the ways of black history, in the ways of knowing what had happened to us as a black people, 
most of our people didn't understand what was going on. So I have a term that I use called fathead Muslim. I tell my wife this term. Mm-hmm. And what a fathead Muslim is, is a, is a, is a person, particularly a black. They don't, you don't have to be a mm-hmm. Muslim by definition. But we believe in the mm-hmm. nation of Islam that all black people are Muslims by nature because that just simply means one who wants to do the will of God, and that's you, sister, and that's uh, all our people. So when you say, when I say fathead Muslim, I'm talking about everybody that's black. A fathead Muslim mm-hmm. is somebody who got knowledge on how to do something but don't share it with nobody. Mm-hmm. See? Yeah. They sit back and they wait for somebody to walk in their office or give them some kind of title before they help people. That's a fathead Muslim. And that's, that could be any black person from any group who's just sitting there waiting for some recognition in order to help people and teach people. Right. I don't want to be one of those. And so that's where my research study came in. Right. But you notice that a lot of times when you have somebody that has that type of information and that type of background, they have probably had to endure a lot of training themselves. You know, they went to college, they study theology, they went through all these different things, and they paid hard-earned money to get these courses taken, and they got their doctorate, they got their PhD, so they're expecting people not to know what they know, because they pay for what they know. So a lot of them feel as if, if I had to pay for my knowledge, you pay for yours. Like, I'm not going to freely give it to you, but if you want to, like, pay for me to come and speak, I'll give you that knowledge in, like, the format of a, a, you know, a seminar, but I'm not just going to freely give it to you because it won't free for me. So that's that's the mental mindset of a man who had to pay for the knowledge that he has. And, like, we had a, a really hot debate about that not too long ago about um, the standards of relearning. That was the type, it was the name of the topic. It was called the standard of relearning. Because when you start in grade school, they get you pre-K about four years old. They hit you all the way up to about 19 when you hit uh, 12th grade. And then when you get accepted to a college and you go to a university, you find out that everything that you have learned for the last 12 years is wrong. Because then you find out what yeah. the real story is about slavery. You find out the real story about how there was um, seven black presidents before the first white one. That's when you find the truth that they did not teach you in grade school. So it's like you're paying to get the truth after you done learned 12 years of the lie. Uh <laughs> So it's like, you know, right. I understand exactly where all of that comes from as far as the fathead Muslim. He wants to be paid for what he knows. He wants to be um, <laughs> the only one with that information um, because he's paid for that information. He's learned that information. He took the time to study to show himself approved. So, yeah, so that's something that people have to – it's not freely given. So I understand their mindset. I mean, even though, you know, yeah. we might be like on – hand where, okay, this is stuff that people need to know, let's share it. You know, there's two different mindsets. There's those who paid for theirs and those who were given theirs freely that just want to share so that somebody else doesn't fall victim to what, you know, they they have um, not been told about. But I know, I know we're running right. real long time. Um, what I want to do is I want to cut to a short break. It's going to be about 40 seconds. Um but when okay. we come back, we're gonna we're gonna give all of your information, okay? Um, as far as sure. all of your social media, your, your internet stuff, um, so people can find your book. So hold on the line for just a moment, okay? All right, I'll be here. All right. You are live at the literary lounge. With your host, Destiny D, bringing you the newest and the brightest of the literary world right to your ear hole. Every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in, listen up, and learn something. Right, we are back at the Literary Lounge, and you are live on the DLR Radio, 
This is Destiny D, and today's date is October 6, 2018. And we have a young man by the name of Michael Muhammad who has been our special guest for today. And he is the author of the new book, Checkmate, The War for the Black Mind, Part 1, The Black Woman. And we have been discussing um, some, some of his book. We have discussed a little bit about himself and uh, his background and things of that nature. And now we want to give you the opportunity to know where to find him. Um, So we're going to ask now, Brother Michael, that you give um, all of your social media information where people can contact you um, so you can do so at this time. Absolutely, and thank you, Sister Destiny. Uh, And uh, let me first say thank you for allowing me to be a guest on your wonderful literary lounge. Uh, This is a wonderful platform uh, for authors and for black people to raise their level of consciousness in life in general. Um, You can find me, brothers and sisters, every Friday, uh, of course, um, on my show, the Nat Turner Library Radio. I'm the executive producer. We have a few shows every Friday night at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Call in numbers 515-605-9882. You can also go to the social media page uh, for Nat Turner Library Radio. I got a few of them. So on Facebook, that is three Facebook pages I have. If you want to befriend me personally, um, of course, I'm very selective about what what people I add personally. So um, if you have some silly stuff in your social media thing, then you're not going to really get my own personal friendship. But you can like my page um, on social media, which is Nat Turner Library Radio Show. That's Nat Turner Library Radio Show. Uh, You can also go to the Checkmate. If you go Facebook again, type in Checkmate, The War for the Black Mind, Part 1, The Black Woman, or just type in Checkmate, The War for the Black Mind. You'll see the cover of my book, which is a sister who's enraged in red. Uh, She's a chess piece holding her head in distress as a black hand and a white hand are pulling on one each side of her. That's our, my social mm-hmm. media page. Check me, The War for the Black Mind on social media. On Facebook, I mean, you can go to Instagram and simply uh, type in 6X Method. That's the letter 6, the letter X Method, as in that's a name given to me by a good friend of mine when we first started the radio program, 6X Method. That'll give you all the updates of National Library Radio. And if you're on Twitter, type in NTLR-Radio. That's NTLR-Radio. You can also go and the primary way to purchase the book and products. I have some wonderful shirts that are for brothers and sisters uh, that you're going to find some black conscious shirts, uh, good price, good quality, black owned and operated, made by a black company as well. Um, You can go to my website to get my copy of my book as well and uh, see anything you need to know about Brother Michael Muhammad at bromichaelmuhammad.com. That's B-R-O-M-I-C-H-A-E-L-M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D. Real simple, bromichaelmuhammad.com. You can also call me direct uh, if you have any questions or you want to place an order or you have a speaking engagement or something you want me to go to, uh, my direct number is 678-906-6306. That's 678-906-6306. And uh, those are the methods that you can uh, purchase my book. Oh, one more, Amazon. Well, two more, actually. First, go to YouTube the podcast for my show and anything that we've done, you just go Nat Turner Library Radio on YouTube. You'll get everything, like the page, all that. But also, you go to Amazon and type in Checkmate. Well, type in Michael Muhammad, M-U-H-M, excuse me, M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D. Type in Checkmate, and then you'll see the cover of my book. You can can purchase the e-version of the book there. But to purchase the hard copy, you must go to bromichaelmuhammad.com. BroMichaelMohammed.com. I am I'm selling autographed copies now. Twenty dollars, twenty dollars, not nineteen ninety five to trick you. It's twenty dollars. Support your brother, um, and we'll get it out to you. All right, now um, just to kind of give us a closing, 
what would you what would you actually tell your potential buyer? Like, what would be your sales pitch for them to grab a copy of your book? Sales pitch. I would. I like to reword that for a moment and say, what is the purpose of my of my research study? Um, the purpose mm-hmm. of it, and it's not. This book is not just for black women. It's about how black people specifically uh, were subjugated. So the purpose of my book has to give historical, factual, research studied, uh, proven glossaried. You can go and check the sources information on the various subjects dealing with um, black male and female sexuality, black history, how did we got to be called what we are, like the word nigger, there's a definition of, 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 excuse me for those who are offended by that word, there's a definition of how we got to be, uh, even in America, how this all got to be, um, uh, some of the misunderstandings about the women's liberation movement in the 60s. So there's a, there's a plethora of everything to the dietary standards that were given to us as slaves mm-hmm. and to the very origin and the very, 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 very origin. There's a section in my book called the Louisiana Mississippi Syndrome. It's a term that I coined, and I'm going to try to patent that, that term so no one else takes it. But the Louisiana Mississippi mm-hmm. Syndrome is the origin of how black male and female relationships got to be where it is today, as well as the difference in how the history of light skin versus dark skin got to even exist. Mm-hmm. And so that's in, uh, that's in uh, one of my latter chapters of the book. This is historical research, not opinions. Um, and I, I would say for those who are interested in the truth of why black folk messed up by this book. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So I, I just want to take a, you know, a second just to thank you so much for allowing us to do this interview with you. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting you at the Black Excellence Award uh, back in, uh, I want to say June or June second. June, yeah, it was um, June, yeah. Yeah, so I, I really, I really appreciate you. You are an upstanding brother, um, and I look forward to seeing part two. Pull in the black black man. Hopefully, it won't take twenty years of research, but. I, oh no, no! I'm, I'm actually writing. I'm that. actually writing it right now as we speak. <laughs> all right, all right. So, with no further ado, I'd like to present to the world, Brother Michael Muhammad. So, um, show your love. Look him up on social media. He's giving you all the plugs as far as his social media and his website. Um, order a copy today, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Destiny Divine. Thank you for all that you do. And audience, hit me up if you have any questions. I'm willing to answer the most difficult questions ever given about the most important subjects. All right. Well, you take care, and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you, and peace be unto all of you. All right. Bye-bye. You are live at the Literary Lounge with your host, Destiny D, bringing you the newest and the brightest of the literary world right to your ear hole. Every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, tune in, listen up. And learn something. All right, guys. Next week on October the 13th, we will have a young lady by the name of Ellie Gamble on the show. So y'all look out for her next week. This is the spot for new hot authors who are given the opportunity to shine each Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time we will showcase a new author here at the Literary Lounge we are taking out the time to give all of our literary friends an opportunity 
to showcase their work. The New Author Spotlight is a platform that allows us to ask up to 10 questions or more to give you, the audience, the most in-depth current information about each writer in their literary piece. We will have a new guest every week. Stay tuned.